I do owe a colleague an inestimable debt. He doesn't know that he was an eye opener for me, literally, because I'd reached a point where I felt that certain individuals in society were untouchable. And I one could only hope that uh, their own peers in the cult of immunity, because it's a cult, it's a cabal, that sooner or later they would fall foul among their own peers and then will be rid of one, the catalog of those want to get rid of, would at least reduce by one, and thereby mutual elimination, mutual war of attrition, will eventually be left with a reasonable, reasonably sanitized society. Among those whom I thought were totally, completely untouchable <clears throat> were the police. And by that I don't mean the man in the street, the scapegoat, the one who's arrested, or taking 500 uh, Naira bribe, uh, or who overreaches himself and shoots the uh, poor student or athlete at the roadblock because he wouldn't part with his 100 Naira. No, I'm talking about those at the very, very top. Normally, they just eased out. You wonder why they're eased out, but it's simple. It's really a falling out among thieves. I was clear Ajibade's <coughs> journal who first made it impossible for one head of the Nigerian police to continue in office. I remember that I was puzzled. I didn't realize at that time how deeply Congress investigative uh, journalist uh, Zeal was. And I called him when, this, when he began his assault, step by step, on that Inspector General of Police. I remember saying to him, are you sure? I said, be careful, because these people, they are they're mafia, and they protect one another. Are you sure you have all your facts right? He said, Prof, don't worry, I have these facts correct. I said, well, in that case, I'm going to sit back and enjoy the fun. <laughs> and eventually, he got his man. I remember that the major, when the major expose came out, there was a huge cartoon of a, a hot bellied, impossibly hot bellied police officer. And with the caption, I can't remember the caption, but the identity was unambiguous, there was no euphemism about it. He named names, it was Tapa Balogun at the time. But well, the question which I later had to ask myself and ask others was this. Because when we're looking at, about who corrupted a certain institution or another, or how did they become corrupt, we never really get to the bottom of it. By the time that finally the final falling out among thieves took place and Balogun was uh, removed from office, and not only that, were charged to court when virtually an incredibly long, uh, inexhaustible list of accounts were traced to him. I also asked a certain question. I said, wait a minute. I know that police are really corrupt, but shall we say that among the various institutions, the police have the most prominent profile of corruption. But the question I asked is, who actually corrupts the police? Who makes sure that agencies of law are corrupt? I'm not talking about other agencies like the judiciary. From time to time, yes, we get the expose. But one institution that we know almost traditionally, which even a child who want uh, a comparison might say it, as corrupt as the police, because we actually see it on the, on the streets, but that's not where the real corruption lies. And I ask the question, who are those who make it their business to corrupt the police? I looked at the list 
of uh, of uh, accounts traced to the, uh, that Inspector General of Police. And when I finally met with uh, Ribadu, I said, you know what? Your job is only partly done. It's not enough to trace these accounts to an individual. Ask yourself how those accounts came there and were constantly replenished. I said to Ribadu, if you solve that riddle for us, because you look at the Inspector General of Police, I said, does it run a sex ring? Does it run a drug barony? Is he dealing in drugs, in other words? Uh, has he been caught uh, lifting oil? Said, of all the charges laid against him, there's none of them. So where does all that money come from? Why does he need all those accounts? And we discovered, of course, that he wasn't even operating most of them. So I said, you solve that riddle. And not only would you have punctured the balloon of corruption in this nation, would also have solved for us how elections are rigged. Mm. Because there is a direct pointer, a direct nexus between that level and pattern of corruption and the degradation of the democratic exercise that we witness in this country. So I said, go right ahead. Talk to people like Kuna uh, Ajibade, they'll give you all the information at their disposal. <laughs> because I'm sure they still have a lot more than they actually published. I said, but follow up on that expose. And I've done this country two, uh, two beneficiary, uh, beneficial deeds. Stem corruption, tracked it to its original source, and solved the issue of democratic failure in this country. Of course, uh, the Inspector General of Police went quietly, meekly, jail. We are aware of who phoned him in hospital to say, keep quiet, just say nothing. I repeat, who said, who phoned Dr. Balogun in hospital and said, just be quiet, don't say anything. And of course he got six months, which he spent in hospital. But who really corrupted Dr. Balogun? Who's responsible for his corruption? Who owned those various accounts? I'm asking, why is it so difficult to track, to follow a paper trail, to pursue numerous clues back to their original uh, source? That's what is known as investigative journalism. And the pioneer of that kind of journalism was together with his colleagues, only And it's because of the example which is set that I very reluctantly agreed to have the, um, the movement for investigative journalism, the foundation, named after me. I'm not very fond of having things named after me. Just my books for which I'm fully responsible. But I'm not responsible for other things which are named after me. But because of that eye-opener, which was given to me, not only by, uh, not just to me, but to the entire nation, by this pioneer in investigative journalism, I found that I, I lost my, some of my modesty a bit, and I said, yes, okay, go ahead. I can associate with this. Let's go all the way, as far as we can, uh, we can go. And I can only urge his fellow, the young journalists, the would-be sleuths, uh, to follow the Persistence, the tenacity, that's the word, of Kunle Ajibade. Forget, forget the fact that he's a jailbird, you know. Uh, sometimes it's a badge of honor. And uh, forget the fact that this man sitting there had a nerve when Abacha was in charge to come to my office in Abelkuta, he would come every morning. And I said, Kuli, why do you keep coming to my office? I said, I want to be here when you are arrested. 
That's investigative journalism for you. <laughs> the other side of it. And one day, finally blotted out. Said, but I don't understand. Why haven't they arrested me? <laughs> I took that as a cue. I made sure a few weeks later, I was not available for arrest. <laughs> so you have no idea how through studying you, I'm also studying my own safety. <laughs> it's a thankless job. I'll be speaking to, again, I agree to address the International Press Institute in Abuja uh, in a short while, in a few weeks. And one of the uh, horrific statistics I encountered by just looking at the state of journalism all over the world today, the number of journalists who've been killed, and the large percentage of those who've been killed, assassinated, were killed, in the cause of investigative journalism. Yes. Far more than journalists who were killed at the war front, yes. the covering war. That's how risky that job is. So I'm very glad that Abaka jailed you because it probably saved your life. So be grateful for small blessings. <laughs> and let me congratulate you on achieving a 60th birthday. And your wife, as I whispered to her, I said, you are the one I should congratulate you because I don't know how you tolerated that man for so many years. It's wonderful when a young man is honored, not just by his peers, but by white-headed geriatrics. <laughs> right.